Okay, good morning. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning on McAllister and Quinn presents Congress to Campus. If everyone could please mute themselves, that will make the, the webinar easier for everyone to listen to. We will take questions after the webinar is over, um, and we appreciate any and all questions you have for, for any of us who are participating in the webinar. Um, I would just want to remind you, many of you are working, currently working with McAllister and Quinn. McAllister and Quinn is a DC-based consulting firm. We work with colleges and universities across the country to increase federal and foundation dollars on campus. Um, McAllister and Quinn is pleased to bring the Congress to campus um, to you today. Um, we have worked with clients who have successfully worked with Congress to campus and we have seen um, many of the, the benefits of, of this program on campus. Um, Congress to campus is a creative way to bring political science and government to, to life on your campus. Um, we work with many clients who are always interested in increasing student engagement, um, increasing ways for students to participate and uh, members of the public in an engaging way. And uh, many campuses highly value these types of opportunities for students to interact with professionals and decision makers. The Congress to Campus program, as we'll learn more about today, is a nonpartisan program that brings members of both parties together in a civil and engaging way on your campus. We think that this is a unique opportunity for both faculty and students to develop professionally and explore potential opportunities and um, professions after they leave your campus. Hi, I'm Sharon Watu. I work with the former members of Congress who host the Congress to Campus program. We are an organization that have been around for over 40 years. Um, we were chartered by Congress and but we receive no taxpayer dollars we are 501c3 and our congress campus program is our oldest program and i if you all are hearing the doorbell sign that's just people signing on don't be alarmed um so our congress to campus program has been around for about 35 years um what we our mission with this program is to give an insider's view of Congress, to show students and um, faculty as well, how the people who make up Congress, how they live, how they work, how they build rela relationships with other members to get the job done, as well as what their family life is like and what brought them to become a member of Congress. We go to schools all over the country Country and in fact, do a couple international programs, but we go to all different types of schools from large, small, city, rural, community colleges to the biggest universities. Um, what our goal is to showcase bipartisanship. We do that by sending a bipartisan pair of former members of Congress to speak at the schools. Um, we know that these uh, former members have different opinions. We embrace that they have different opinions. They have different views on how things can be accomplished in Congress. But what we are able to show that you don't necessarily see very well these days is that they can discuss issues civilly and respectfully with each other. We also ask our former members to encourage students to become good citizens, to be a part of the public service of our country, so some, something so simple as just voting. Um, the bipartisan pair will come to your campus for two to three days, okay? Um, what you can do, what we ask the schools to do is to put together a schedule when the former members come there. We encourage the, I'll just call them the administrator at the school, the administrator of the program from the school um, they are typically from a political science department or a social science in the social science fields, but we ask them to look outside of the political science department when they try and schedule classes for the former members to visit. Um, it is important from our perspective is that um, no matter what discipline a student is studying, that they understand that Congress can impact them. Um, just a quick story, we once had former members that went to one school and they met with um, dental hygienists, which sounds strange, but 
the health care bill was being debated at the time, and they didn't even understand how it might impact their careers. So um, we do encourage you, although it doesn't always work, that you can have the former members visit classrooms outside of political science. We also have, the schedule can also include mealtime where they meet with students or student organizations or faculty members. Um, we ask the schools to consider having the former members interviewed by the school newspaper or the no local newspaper or TV or radio. Um, we also often have the former members participate in campus-wide or even public forums in the evening that are um, well, and when we get to our former members who are here with us today, they can tell you a little bit about more of their experience. Um, what we are pleased to say is that 70% um, of the students' attitudes change. We asked students to take a survey before and a survey after, and they change. They're, um, they feel better about Congress. They have a better understanding of Congress. Thank you for one second. Um, we also are happy to know that every time we finish a Congress to campus visit, all of the schools say they want to bring it back to their campus again. So they're all very pleased with the results of this. Um, um, how you can bring Congress to campus to your school is actually quite easy. Um, the first thing that you would do is find a semester and find a date um, that will work for your school. We you don't have to give us choices of dates. Um, every school has different breaks, so it's best if you pick a date that works best for your school. Um, we have a very simple application that's on our website at www.usafmc.org under our Congress to Campus section. Um, you just fill that out and send it to us, and then we can begin the process. Um, the first thing that you would end up doing is trying to get that schedule together, and um, you can stay in close contact with us. We will help you with that. Um, while you're doing that, we will look for a bipartisan um, team to come to your school, and we will start planning their travel. Their travel from wherever they are to your school is part of our obligation, both um, logistically and financially, that's our responsibility. Your responsibility as a school is you will arrange the schedule and also arrange for the hotel, meal, and ground transportation. That's also your financial responsibility. And we ask for a $1,500 contribution to our organization for our administration. Um, now uh, we are gonna go live. We have two former members here with us today who have been on several Congress campus visits. In fact, um, one of the former members here is the co-chair of this program for our organization. Um, so let's start. I'm going to take the role of a what might happen with the professor and the two former members sitting in a classroom. So if you imagine the two former members are sitting in front of your classroom. I'm the professor. You are in the student chair. Um, first, we have Dan Maffei. He is a Democrat from New York. He served in Congress from 2009 to 2011, and then again in 2013 to 2015. He was on the Financial Services Committee, the Armed Services Committee, the Judicial Science and Technology Committee. Until recently, Mr. Maffei was on the Federal Maritime Commission a position that he was appointed to by President Obama. Currently, Mr. Maffei is teaching at George Washington University. Um, we also have Tim Petri, who is here with us today. Tim is a Republican from Wisconsin and served in Congress from 1979 to 2015. He served on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committees, as well as the Education Workforce Committee. He was also the chairman of the U.S. House Representative British Parliament Exchange. He was part of the U.S. House Japanese Diet Discussion, the House French Caucus, House German Caucus, and has delved into both domestic and foreign issues over his many years in Congress. Um, just a quick housekeeping. Uh, we are not taking uh, um, audio questions. We are going to take them through the chat room. So if you have a question that you would like to pose to us, if you could go into the chat box and you could type it in, we will get to your questions. 
for now. Again, I'll continue as a professor and start the discussion as if it would be in one of your classes. Um, so, um, Tim and Dan, uh, I think the best place to start is what made you decide to become a member of Congress? Tim, why don't we start with you? Well, it's, it's uh, I think everyone has their, their own story, in, in, and I probably had a lot of different reasons. Uh, there was an opportunity, uh, but I was interested uh, long before the opportunity arose. Uh, I, in my case, I think a couple of things. One, uh, my grandparents were immigrants from Norway, and I grew up uh, sort of across the street from them. I think it was up at home. I went over to my grandparents' house, and my grandfather uh, had never gone to school in the United States. He could speak English, but he couldn't write it very well. He was following all the things happening in this country. And he was saying, if you ever get a chance, you really, people in the United States uh, take an awful lot for granted. He said, they don't realize the opportunities that they have. And if you ever have a chance to contribute to this the system, you really should. And he, they had seven children, one of them being my mother. And they all were involved in uh, you know, uh, school board and city council and things like that. And I think it was part of that. The other one was that I served in the Peace Corps for a while in Somalia in Africa. And that gives you a chance living in a different culture to not only learn about that country, but you learn something about yourself and your own country. And uh, I, I think uh, we're very lucky in the United States and we really do have an obligation to, to participate uh, and uh, 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 make sure that the system that we've benefited from is available for the next generation. So those are a few of the reasons. Thanks. Well, my story is maybe a little bit different than a lot. I didn't um, work my way up um, the political ladder in a, in a local place, although I was in local television news in my hometown. But then I decided um, I really wanted to get involved in, um, more, more politically, and I ended up working as a staff person um, on Capitol Hill. Senator, a couple of senators and then for a committee of Congress. And it really never occurred to me that I would ever become a member myself um, until only a few years before I actually ran. Um, and what happened in my hometown, uh, there were no people in my party. I come from a, a pretty Republican area, area and I'm a Democrat in upstate New York, very far away from New York City. Um, and um, nobody ran against my uh, the person, my congressman back at home He's doing a pretty good job, for one thing, um, but also it just wasn't a, a very big area. Well, that I sort of noted that. Um, and then um, what happened was there was one particular issue. Um, and even I thought he was doing a pretty good job, like with the other party. But there was one or two particular issues that I disagreed with a lot that I felt needed to be heard. And since there was nobody who ever wanted to run against him, I didn't have to jump a line of Democrats <laughs> and run against him. In fact, people called me a sacrificial lamb uh, when I first ran. So that's how I, I got involved. And of course, I lost that first race, which often happens. Yeah. But then uh, he retired, and, and when the seat was open, it was a lot easier to, to win. So we have our first question here, um, and it's for both of you former members. Um, what, do you, what do you gain by participating in this program? So why do you participate in the Congress to Campus program? Well, we're not paid. It's, a, it's voluntary. And uh, of course, the Associ U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress uh, is uh, made up of both Republicans and Democrats from the House and Senate who serve for a variety of years from all over the country and, and even in some of the territories of the, of the United States. And I, I think uh, the reason we, we it's volunteer service again. Yeah. And it's a, it's, a, it's a way of, uh, we can help explain to people the importance of participating in our representative uh, government uh, system. Everyone can't necessarily be in Congress, but people can be on the school boards, they can be on the city councils and town boards, uh, all kinds of advisory associations, and do something when they have a chance. Obviously, when you're young, you've got to get, get good grades, and you've got to uh, get a job, and you've got to establish your family and all that. But after uh, your establish uh, giving something back to the community even through a trade association or a union or uh, whatever or professional association or through uh, community service millions of americans do that and it's what, one of the things that makes our country great you know uh when you're in office whatever, whatever you might hear or read about congress it's a very very intense job i think for everybody you really don't have time to do much education or anything else maybe in your district you can visit a college or two but even that's challenging 
So uh, I do think it's an obligation of former members to try to do that kind of outreach. Um, because my district was of the other party, um, I wasn't, didn't serve in, in Congress for very long, two, you know, a couple of really good terms, but, but I was also a former member at a fairly young age, and, and so I really dedicated myself to both in the, my uh, teaching at uh, George Washington here in, in D.C., but also to getting out to campuses. The other thing is, is that it really gives you a chance to meet Republicans, and not only Republicans you served with, uh, but other Republicans. I got the chance to meet a guy named Steve Kuykendall, Congress to campus. He served about 10 years before I did, also for not long. And he was a Republican who served from a very Democratic district. <laughs> and we had more in common than yeah. you think. I mean, other than the fact that he had a distinguished war record, and I don't. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we, we had a lot of things in common, and we were both middle of the roaders, you know, trying mm -hmm. to find our way in, in, a, in challenging districts. And, and that sort of, and then not just, you know, and, and Tim, I knew Tim in Congress a little bit, we talked to each other once or twice, but we weren't on the same uh, committees or anything like that and to meet a senior member like him. So for me, it's just a really good opportunity to, to meet people and, um, and particularly people in the other party. And, and yeah, you learn they're, they're people just like you and they're just as dedicated to public service and they may differ on uh, a few issues, often less than you think, um, but but they're, they're, that's a really important thing. And hopefully the students see that as well when we, when we come visit. So the audience at colleges is going to be students and um, there will be quite a few classes that are poli-sci classes. What can you tell students about opportunities that they might, if they're interested in pursuing a role in politics, what would be a good next step for them? What, what would be good for them to do if they are interested in taking that path? Um, well, I'll start, because uh, I'm a little closer to it yeah, than you. Yeah, yeah. Um, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing with political jobs, I mean, first of all, of course, you don't need a license. Uh, to run for office. You don't have to be a lawyer. I think that's important. Although law school is an, an option, I think, for a lot of political science students and others. Um, and certainly nobody, even if they're not in political science, should, should say, well, I can't do that because I didn't have a political science degree. But it does help, and it does help to know what you're getting yourself into. Well, my degree was actually in history, my undergraduate degree. Uh, but so, you know, you, you, you try to decide what you're going to do. There are a lot of different options. Um, you can get involved in local politics. Um, whether it's running for office or working on campaigns, I think almost everybody's worked on a campaign or two before they come to it, or, or working for a local office holder, or, or just you know working for the government or volunteering. There's all sorts of things one can do. If you want to work on Capitol Hill, that's fine. Of course, you have to get to Washington to do that, and often it'll be very difficult to find your first job. But if you, what I've found, and you know, you have to be persistent. And I started as an intern in the House, um, and you know, my. my the person who I interned for always used to, you know, was still in Congress by the time I became his colleague. So it does happen. Um, and then, uh, so there's, that's another avenue. Um, there's, of course, journalism. There's all sorts of ways to be involved, lobbying, et cetera. There are graduate schools. I, I teach at a graduate school. It's fairly rare that actually teaches about practical politics, but there's also public policy graduate schools as well. I think everybody's a little different, but there's so many possibilities. The one thing I would say is you have to it's just like any other kind of profession that um, you will find something, but it may take a little while and, and you can't worry, you can't let your ego uh, suffer too much from rejection. The fact is, is uh, everybody goes into this very, very rarely does anybody go straight to a, a, a big job. You, you sort of, you have to pay your dues, but more than that, you just have to keep in the, keep in the game. And, and by the way, it doesn't really matter what party you are. And if you don't know what party you are, that's okay too at the beginning of your career, yes. We have a, a two-party system, but um, frankly, I think it, it needs more people that aren't so connected to their party. And I'd say this, that, that there are a lot of, everyone in college is very aware of this, and a lot of colleges are working on, on uh, broadening the range of internship opportunities for people in various uh, companies uh, or other things that would give practical uh, training as part of their education. and. Uh, uh, the same thing is true in politics. There are a lot of opportunities to be an intern in state legislative offices, in uh, uh, congressional district offices, uh, where you live or where the school is. Uh, work for the trade association as an intern that is, is dealing on issues uh, before the legislature is called lobbying. It has a very bad name until people understand how it really works within the system. It's a, it's a vital part of our uh, of our representative system, actually. So th there are a lot of opportunities like that. And of course, uh, they're almost all unpaid, which is the downside of it. Uh, volunteering in a campaign, if you're interested in becoming a candidate someday yourself, I think is one of the very best things you can do. 
because you, you learn a lot about how it really uh, uh, is. It's quite different than it looks like when you're just seeing the end product on TV or the ads. And uh, you, you uh, uh, learn from the mistakes that the, the uh, candidate, uh, makes. candidate makes or that you make in working with the candidate, but, it, but you, you're, the, you're not the candidate. So you live to fight another day. So there, yeah. I think working in the campaigns. Is it's important to get involved. Go to your local campaigns, your local state legislator, council person, or, or congressman. And it doesn't matter if you're the different party. Yeah, they may not give you a job, but somebody in that office will help you start that process. So we have another question. Um, can the representatives relay a story about a particularly rewarding interaction with a student or students? So you both have been on many Congress to campus visits. Um, and I know I've heard from some former members that they've actually kept in touch with students over time and sort of guided them on that process to get an internship. But maybe you, maybe one of you well, has I could tell one or two, we've had students uh, in my district, the biggest city was Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I was actually from Pontiac. We had a district office there. And uh, we reached out to the political science departments and others for, to, for them to nominate students to be interns in our office or in the Washington office. And a couple of these uh, young people ended up uh, working summers uh, in, the, in the campaign uh, with a, a little uh, help. Of financial help or in our office. Sometimes they would, if they did a good job in the district office, they, and they, they're working with the school, they had a chance through a Congress to campus type program to spend a semester working in Washington, D.C. in the congressional office. And one of them ended up uh, over time becoming uh, my district director and now is a member of the Wisconsin State uh, uh, Assembly. Another one uh, who was really nice job uh, of driving and working on different things in the campaign and came out and worked in our office in DC, uh, uh, got a job in, in Washington, but then now is back and is a city manager in uh, a, a very nice community in, in the heart of the valley in, in uh, a, a little shoot in, in Wisconsin. So uh, it's a way of getting involved in the government side of operation, both as a candidate or even as, a, as an administer, administrator. And that, that experience is invaluable in those jobs because you know you have a real realistic appreciation of how it works and what's possible and how to work the system. Yeah, usually in every Congress to campus visit, there's you know a handful of students who are really really interested and come after you up to you afterwards and ask for a card and give them a card and, and then you're in touch with by email at least. Um, and if they come to Washington or you know your home just wherever you live, you you sometimes will meet with them and have coffee, and give them advice and that sort of thing. I, I haven't been doing it for so long that any of them landed uh, <laughs> in, you know, in, in those positions yet, but that's only because uh, it's only been a few years. Okay, we have another question. What kinds of campus or community activities make the visit most meaningful for both you and for the audience? Well, you know, a lot of these, really just going to talk to classes. I mean, some of these campuses we go and, and they really show us around and give us a good tour. And, and uh, just at one campus that had a memorial to Walter Cronkite. Saw that that was pretty impressive, um, but the truth is, it's really the interaction with the students, and there's usually a form or two, and those are important, and they usually invite the community. But but often it's just in the classroom. It's just the basic classroom visits, um, particularly if we're given enough, enough time. Students are always shy at first, I think, and they, they don't want to ask us things. But they typically want to ask us the tough questions, and then we say, "Go ahead, and, you know, give it to us. We, we, we can take it." So um, I think those are the, some of the most, and, and I think when the students ask questions that seem like obvious answers or, or to them and then they kind of realize when we answer them that it's not as simple as they thought um, that's what really I think changes those attitudes about about Congress and members of Congress that you know, simply it's the, the, the media television whatever you watch whatever you read on the internet it's just not the incentive of those folks to report the kind of human side of Congress and so I think that's the, the valuable thing when you can just sit and interact um, there are also some small dinners and, and usually when you go there's a small dinner or lunch or breakfast for students who are particularly interested um you know want to want to uh, dine with you and that's fine we love that yeah i think uh, i agree with everything dan said and i would add though that uh i, I find the community forums very interesting we always 
when we were yeah, in the office, we'd do town meetings and this sort of thing. So it's somewhat similar to that. It's easier, though, now that we're not in office. It's much easier than you're, we're not in office. And, and it's probably easier for the audience, too, because they're, they're, they're more just to uh, sort of uh, get a feeling or get a little bit of background about some issues. or, or But you, you, you get a nice mix of people from the, the community, both the, both the university community and the larger community in which the uh, university is located. And the other thing is that I think at a lot of these schools, the, the president or uh, a dean or someone will host a, a breakfast or a dinner and, and involve uh, some faculty members and some administrators and a lot of students at that event. And I think it's a ni nice opportunity to interact informally uh, with a range of university people and discuss uh, uh, things. And I learned, I learned from that. One thing that disappoints students, some students, um, but also I think gives other students hope is the fact that they see a Republican and a Democrat and we end up agreeing on so many things that they ask, at least most of it. Uh, we may disagree on a particular thing or a particular vote, but even in a particular issue, it may turn out that we agree on 60 or 70 percent of the issue, but we disagree on a couple of, of other things. And I think students are surprised about that. And it, it makes sense because it's not that, you know, the, the news media is not going to report when members of Congress agree. But the image that that gives students is that members of Congress always disagree and are always in each other's throats. And when they see us and they know, okay, well, we, you know, we had a exchange and we voted differently on a particular issue. But lo and behold, gosh, we could probably have come to a compromise with just the two of us uh, on campus. And, that, and that's true of most members. Um, and I think that is something that is very important. Even so it does disappoint some students who try to, you know, put an issue in and, and want, a, want an argument. That, that's not what we need to do. We're not, uh, you know, we, we're more interested in education than in, in uh, making uh, making every single point of ours. Uh, exactly. Members, the general spirit of these Congress campus things is that, well, we, we certainly vote differently, disagree often yeah. on issues. Uh, the purpose is not to engage in another debate. The purpose is to explain why the differences exist, yeah. what the differences are. It's often, uh, they're not personal differences at all. No. There are differences in different constituencies. The American yeah, people absolutely. disagree on yeah. different issues. And, and uh, the most one that's, uh, I just won't get into it in the detail, but the gun issue is a good example of that. People vote wildly differently to explain the politics of that and the history of it within our, uh, con our uh, congressional system uh, uh, is very enlightening to uh, people that uh, when I do this con Congress campus program exists not only in the United States, we have members of Congress go over to England, for example, mm -hmm. we're talking about Germany, to talk about the American system, the whole right. world now has gotten a lot smaller. And at every program I was in in England, at the colleges and talking to school, high school groups, uh, someone would ask about the American gun uh, debate, yeah. and, and they couldn't figure it out because it's so different in England. Well, and what they don't see uh, of, for, of current members on the news is, how much we respect each other's views and although we may disagree we both acknowledge an issue like guns is a tough issue that, that, that isn't an easy solution and, and neither extreme is, is right off so there's a quick question about um the cost to host a congress to campus program at your school um so i'll take that one before i turn back to the former members so the school is responsible for a 1500 dollars contribution to the former members of Congress for our administrative cost. And then they are responsible for the hotel, the meals, and any ground transport transportation there may be. Again, the, the former member, I think Tim mentioned that the former members volunteer their time. They take time off from work. They get no honorarium. They get no pay for this. They do this because they believe in the program. Um, so I think that- And the travel to the school is paid for Yes, so any transportation by plane or by train or even a driving cost uh, to the school is picked up by um, FMC. We are in a partnership with the Stennis Center and we work with them to make those arrangements. We do the arrangements and we pick up the cost for that. Economy class. Always <laughs> economy class. We are 501c3 still. Um, one thing that has been coming up lately, and it's maybe you could just give a little background then maybe we'll go into some of those touchy topics is um, we hear a lot about regular order um, but I'm not sure a lot of people understand and I don't think students really understand what 
when people talk about going back to regular order. Um, Tim, I think you were there when there was regular order, but you left when the regular order was not quite as um, functioning. Maybe um, if you both could talk about what you think about regular order and if you think that will help um, some of the the strife that's in Congress right now. Well, I, I, I mean, I certainly, the regular order was wonderful, uh, especially for junior members and minority members of, of Congress. I served as long in the minority as in the majority. I was elected in 1979 and the opponents have been in the minority for all but just a few years from the Great Depression in 1929. And I still can remember as a freshman introducing a, uh, a, a, a bill that turned into an amendment that I, seemed like a good idea. Everyone sort of opposed it. Uh, uh, it wasn't a partisan thing. And, but the regular order was that when bills that were authorization bills came to the floor, anyone, any member could offer any germane amendment. Uh, nowadays, for a variety of reasons, but people with the way that works, they do gotcha amendments instead of serious uh, amendments. And so the leadership tends to tamp down on all amendments. It's a bit, very bad. Anyway, my amendment was voted against by two on both parties uh, in the education committee. When it came to the floor of the House, uh, some people uh, uh, learned about who weren't on the committee in the other party actually said they thought it was a good idea and it was adopted. And, so, <laughs> and, and uh, the whole appropriation process, they're trying to get back to, to it, but uh, if the, the process is a little different than people think. There's a, a authorization process and then an appropriation process. There, so there are two parallel tracks. You can authorize a lot of legislation and it's never funded. So it's more it turns into a press release, really. Uh, I had a senator once in Wisconsin who made a career of voting for almost every authorization and against yeah. almost every appropriation. Yeah. And he said, oh, I didn't vote for that. Or I said, yeah, I supported that. And people didn't know the difference. But uh, uh, so anyway, regular order is, is it's something that you pass legislation, you have a conference committee, member representatives uh, meet and discuss it. That's another very important part of the process that's broken down a lot uh, so, because things are, are in stalemate. That you get these large, messy bills that are not very well written and that are very hard for the people to administer. Uh, so uh, I, I, the quicker you can get back to better regular order, the happier, I, I better the system would be like. Yeah, I take a little bit more of a historical view. Um, I mean, I, you know, the, I was on a congressional committee staff and obviously we dealt with, you know, the fact that it wasn't regular order. But one of the things you sort of learn when you study history is regular order is, is a, even regular order is a fairly recent uh, occurrence. Um, you know, the House, particularly the House representatives, is a very majoritarian institution. Um, and in a way, when, when Tim first went to Congress and the Democrats had such a large majority, now their majority was really divided into two factions. Right. But they had such a large majority, but they could afford to do regular order. In fact, they kind of had to in order to placate factions within their caucus. Now it's much different. Um, so, you know, you look at the House of Representatives, if you read the Constitution, and I really recommend everybody to just read the Constitution. Um, it's and, not hard. It's yeah, hard. I know, I know. And I, we, we, most of my former members carry around a book, but I, I've, got, <laughs> I've got an app. Um, but, uh, and students can just download it for free and you know you, you read it and it's very actually even though the biggest part of the Constitution is about Congress issue article one the first part in the, in the most words it actually gives very little guidance and it leaves Congress to, to do its own ministry and uh, and so a lot of it is reacting to the politics in the community in the, in the broader public now that said there's certain things certain ways of the way we elect members of Congress the way districts are drawn um, even the way that we decide where to live and, and how states have changed in terms of red states and blue states that have changed and, 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 and more and more the people who participate and therefore the people who members of Congress listen to the most tend to be more in the extremes, even though I'm convinced that the American public actually is not, um, or even maybe less so, but so many people are busy in their lives, a lot of students, I mean, you know, I'm sure there's students listening to this who don't even vote, I'm not, I'm not, don't call yourselves out, but, but you know, go register and vote because it's important. Uh, but that's okay. I, it's also understandable. Um, but we do need more people to sort of participate. And I think if they do, and if there's that middle, you know, that middle is sort of heard more, then you will hear, you will have more uh, members wanting regular order and making that demand on their leadership, um, so-called regular order. Um, you know, it, it would be nice, but as Tim says, it's good for the minority, 
and if the minority is in the minority, then the majority very well may not do it. And that's what we're seeing in the Senate when the Senate Democrats were in the majority. Um, they wanted to rush on a Supreme Court nominee, and they were the ones, you know, uh, changing the rules. And now that the Republicans are in the majority and the Democrats are in the minority, the Republicans want to rush on a Supreme Court nominee, and the Republicans want to change the rules. So, you know, it's, it, 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 I don't think it's who's in charge. I think it has to do with the, the complex nature of our democracy right now. So I just want to ask one hard question. We have midterms coming up. Predictions? Well, it's, a week is a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so uh, any prediction, no one really knows. Actually, uh, uh, I shouldn't necessarily say this, but most of the Republicans that I talk to privately think it's very unlikely that they will maintain control of the House of Representatives, uh, but uh, they're more, more likely to maintain and maybe even add a seat or two in the Senate. Uh, uh, the one person I know who disagrees with this, or did a while back, the friend of mine I served with for many, many years, is longer, he was in Congress longer than I am, Nick Raycall from West Virginia, yeah, yeah, yeah. West Virginia, which has moved heavily Republican and his district moved from being strongly Absolutely. Democratic to being Republican. Well, he's served all those years. He thinks that uh, the Republicans are going to do better than, uh, than uh, yeah. either the Democrats or Republicans think uh, right now. But all I've heard is that polls have been coming out, and, and you see in the papers some of them leak or whatever. And the Republicans seem to be uh, uh, in that a lot of them uh, in, in very serious trouble. Yeah. So I mean, you know, like in my own district, um, is is not considered competitive. I mean, you think it would be since it was held by a Democrat fairly recently. But I'm the only Democrat ever who has <laughs> who has gotten it on the competitive list. So, um, you know, I I mean, I think predictions are tough. So I will, I will kind of wimp out and say I predict it's going to be very close either way. Whoever maintains the House and whoever, may, whoever gets the Senate, if the Republicans maintain the House, will be very close. If Democrats get the House, they'll be close. Probably too close for either party to be comfortable. One interesting possibility is that the Democrats pick up one seat in the Senate, a net one seat. So they may lose one or two, uh, but gain two or three. And that would mean um, Vice President Mike Pence, who both of, our, both of us are personal friends with since we served with him in the House, um, he would have to stay in town because he would have the <laughs> deciding vote in the Senate whenever they have a 50-50 tie. So for Mike's, you know, ability to travel, I hope that doesn't happen, but I do think it would be interesting for the country. So um, are we, I think, ready to wrap up or no? Okay. I mean, what, whatever you need. Okay. So I think I want to ask, I, I just want to ask one more, I want to ask another question about personal life. Um, so. We all know you have DC offices and you have district offices, and um, it really can be challenging for families to have to deal with that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your family life went while you were in. Did you live in DC? Did you move? Did you? How did you go back and forth between DC and the district? All right. Well, so you know, I it, I think it is the hardest piece. Um, because it's very, very challenging to live in two places. Um, a little easier for me because my I was fairly close in terms of a plane ride. You could, in a pinch, drive it. But um, but it's very, very challenging, I think, to have a family. Most, a lot of members of Congress don't serve until their kids are grown or nearly grown. And there's a reason for that, because you want to be close to your kids. It used to be, and, and Tim can talk to this, that members would move their families to DC. And, th and that was OK, and everybody expected that. But now, today, people. Uh, just think that if members are in D.C., they've gone beltway and they, they can't relate. So, so many members live in their offices, which frankly, I think is strange. Um, there's no bathroom. There's a bathroom, but there's no shower there, for instance, and there's rats in some of those buildings. <laughs> um, so that's not a good solution. Um, but for me, you know, I did. I just went back and forth every week, at least every week, sometimes a couple of times a week, mostly uh, once a week. And, um, and that was the way it was. And, and I didn't have a child yet until... Um, you know, late in my last term, uh, I had a baby. So, you know, I'm a little older for a first time dad, but that's, uh, I resolved it by leaving Congress and, and you know, now I have a four year old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My voters resolved it for me, although I, I think, I think, yeah, the writing was done in the fall in the yeah. district, but uh, after redistricting. But, yeah. but that, the point is, is that it, it, it's a lot easier to, uh, I miss some things about Congress, certainly, and I miss my constituents in serving them, but there's a lot of things I don't miss. And, and one of those is that back and forth. I don't know how. I'll take advice from, 
from you. you were, yeah, there's no easy answer. It's, it's, The kit and an old farmer sitting at a the table there. He's going to sit down. So I sat, sat down. It turned out his first job, sort of out of out of high school, was to drive the newly elected congressman to Washington. Oh wow! Back in the 1920s, and it took him like five days. He said because there were a lot of places that were they had to wait for ferry boats across rivers. There were the interstate system didn't exist, let alone much yeah. of a highway system or or bridge system because it was just translating from horse and buggy buggy days. Wow. Uh, and people. We're still, when I uh, first was elected in 1979, uh, there were, uh, you know, some people wouldn't fly still. And there were people who would go take the train once or twice a year out to see Seattle, Washington to their districts yeah. and the rest of the time they were in Washington, D.C. The expectations, though, have changed. So in my case, I wasn't married when I was elected. I met my wife in Washington, D.C. She was from Indiana, but... Uh, uh, and and uh, so we we had a home here in D.C. and a home in in uh, Wisconsin, and I would kind of go back and forth, and they would go back and forth. And there were a few people who were elected back uh, about the time I uh, was that still have that s system. A lot of people lived in McLean or other places. Yeah. Tom Delay, I think, was one. Of the well, he became a leader. Yeah, very hard. Uh, and but but there are 70, 80 of them now. Who live in their offices, uh, basically, and it's not a very healthy situation. But the problem is, it's so easy to travel. It's uh, uh, Congress is not in session very much anymore. Three or four days a, a week. Uh, so, so, and so you're only maybe in Washington two nights. Yeah. Uh, sort of hard to justify uh, uh, on the salary. There's a strange double double standard if you're if you're. Um, in Washington, then your district media basically says you're not around, yeah. right? Uh, and you're missed at home. But if you're in the district, then the national media, like CNN, will report you're on vacation, even though you might be going to your office every day and meeting constituents 10 hours a week, 10 hours a day. Um, it, it, so it, it is a, it's a big challenge and there's that double standard. And it, it's actually hurt Congress a lot because one of the reasons, I mean, Congress is you know Latin for come together, right? It's, 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 it's a conglomerate of people from all different walks of life and, and geographies and, and beliefs. But when we come together, we do find that we can find agreement on some things, not everything, but agreement on some things. And that's how things happen. <clears throat> and that's how it was originally designed. But, you know, since the Constitution, it's where, where it was difficult for members to get home at all. And one of the reasons why they had an election every two years was just so members would come home once two, every two years, because it was so challenging right. to go through those roads. Yeah. And then we go to the areas of trains. And stuff. Now, with a, with a modern airplane, it's, you know, people are going home, but the problem with that is they're never in town to meet with each other very often. And the, the you know, the congressional session in those votes is just not long enough. And so you don't really get to know each other like we did. And, and I mean, a current member is never going to say this because it's going to sound like, oh, I don't want to go home. But the truth is there's reasons why members of Congress should be in Washington together, um, even, uh, even if they're not, you know, always voting or whatever, just to be able to discuss and know know each other and, and work things out. And it's, it's in that sense, it's a shame that members do go home so, so free. One thing that uh, was done when I was first elected, which actually was sort of a compromise of that, uh, Carl Perkins was Democratic chairman of the Education Committee, would like to have field hearings. And the deal was, if you would agree uh, to uh, go on the field hearing of other people's district, he would have a hearing in your district, yeah. and as a new member, it was wonderful exactly. to bring in a senior chairman from another, another party, party, party to co yeah. come to schools in your district and have a hearing on educational uh, yeah, issues. So there's seven or eight of us would uh, sign up from the committee in both parties to do that. And we, of course, we, first of all, we go to the chairman's district for a couple of days, yeah. but then we went to Illinois and we go to Wisconsin and to Michigan and Minnesota and and maybe Ohio uh, at, uh, on a, uh, and you get to know other members that way too. That's by, by working together on, on uh, committee issues. Well, traveling abroad, actually. Yeah. Members used to go on uh, various diplomatic trips and, and get to know uh, uh, legislators from other countries and those sort of issues, get to know trade issues, very, very important. But in today's media environment, it almost doesn't matter where you go, you're going to be accused of going on vacation. I know one 
a representative who went to South Sudan, where there's been a big famine. <laughs> he was on going on vacation. He had to fly, it was so remote, he had to fly a private plane. And so, yeah. the, but the media he said, "Oh no, he's flying on a private plane to, you know, to somewhere in Africa." Yeah. It's gotten to a point where you really, you know, you can't go anywhere. I mean, I, I only the only place I went as a member of Congress uh, was was Afghanistan because. You know, I visited and I visited troops from our district. Yeah, members have died. I mean, Nikki Leland, I think. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Africa and, and, yeah. and Ethiopia, and, yeah. and of course the thing where the poisoning happened down in uh, uh, Guyana. Or yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it does. It does happen. So it's it's not that members are traveling for vacation reasons, but it's challenging. And I, and I understand where people are coming from. They don't want to see taxpayer dollars wasted. And there was there has been abuse. It's not like. It's all, you know what I mean? It's not like every trip uh, made sense. There are trips, I won't mention any names, but where people have gone golfing in Scotland as allegedly. So, you know, you have those abuses and then, and then the whole system kind of falls. Well, I think one thing that we definitely heard is the insider's view. There is no way that you can read this in a textbook. There's no way that you can understand this by just watching TV and seeing what goes on in Congress. I think you both have given even unknowingly, a real insider's view, a real better understanding of the workings of Congress, which is the intention of a Congress to campus visit. So I'd like to ask just one more question. And Dan, you just said you just were on a Congress to campus visit yep. with Steve Kuykendall. Yep. Maybe you could just quickly Missouri Western. go through, yeah, Missouri Western. And I know they, they gave us glowing review for you guys. So you know that. And Steve contacted me and said it was a great trip too. Um, if maybe you could just go through what the schedule was like. Just oh yeah. Well, I mean, they put us to work. I yeah. mean, that is the, that is the one thing. And I, and I think that's good. Well, um, I so, will say that I tell yeah. them to put you in campaign mode. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. So, you know, <laughs> um, usually we get there on a Sunday because, uh, you know, you don't want to waste, the, you know, school day time with, with transportation and, um, you know, and, and the school does have to pay for the lodging. That's okay. There's usually decent hotels that aren't too expensive around. Nobody's, nobody's, uh, none of us are expecting. They usually have an arrangement. For yeah. Local yeah, local usually they have an arrangement. We just stay wherever they normally do. No one's expecting four star, believe me. Um, and besides, we're not there very much because they pick us up very early in the morning. We usually have, we, we both days there, we have breakfast with students. Um, and then, uh, you know, we usually, oh gosh, I think three, two or three classes in the morning. And then they'll usually have a luncheon with students. Um, and then, uh, two or three classes in the evening. It was actually Constitution Day when we were there, so we did have a, a morning, more public event. And then we, and then almost always, uh, there's an evening event that's usually open to the public and the press, and that's fine, sort of like a town hall meeting, like Tim was saying. Um, and then, uh, and then you know, usually we're there another morning because there's another couple classes to go to. So it's usually a day and a half pretty packed. Um, and, you know, we're usually sent to a lot of classes. Some schools combine classes. Gives a slightly bigger group of students, but we can talk longer, particularly um, if those classes are 50 to 50 minutes, it's sort of short. Um, and some schools, you know, prefer us to, to go to different classes. Some of them are big classes, some of them are small classes. And, and uh, you know, that's what it is. You know, we're just sort of, you know, brought around. We, we say very little. Um, sometimes we're asked to give a brief uh, presentation, five minutes about, you know, where Congress is, or in the case of Missouri Western, you know, what the Constitution means to us, et cetera, as former members. But for the most part, it's, it's students active, asking questions, getting answers, us asking questions of them sometimes. So they're not off the hook completely uh, when we're coming to class. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it's interesting. Tim, Tim and I have been together on, on one and, you know. I think we went to yeah. Cumberland, Cumberland uh, Community College. Um, well, I think that gives you a pretty good idea. I know uh, administrators, staff, provosts are very, very busy people, and I think that we did it. Do you, did you want to close with anything, Jessica? I'm sure. I would just say thank you for tuning in today, and everyone who's registered will receive a recording of the webinar and the slides, um, which once again uh, provide you with instructions on how to fill out an application and answer some of your campus's questions about what a day would look like. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.